Uh, let's see. I think it should be going. Okay. The last week we were talking about the gifts that the Lord has for those that come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit indwells us, we receive that, a gift. And you may have more than one gift, depending on what the Holy Spirit has you do in your body. Because, I mean, the gifts are for the building up of the body, for bringing the body together, bringing and providing for each other. That's what the giftedness is for. And it's in the use of those gifts and in the use of them in the body, that's what the world looks into and says, wow, these guys really love each other. If we don't put our gifts into use, then we don't look a whole lot different than what the world looks like on the outside from us. So, but you say, well, then how do we put these gifts into use? And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Because, I mean, it's not just something that just automatically happens. It has to have order and there has to be a requirement for unity. Jesus prayed for that, and when he gave his priestly prayer just before he went up to the Garden of Gethsemane, in his priestly prayer, he prayed, and you've heard me say this before in, in John 17, that you, he had prayed to the Lord, Father, just as you and I are one, I pray that they may become one. In other words, there, there, it's Christ knew that the only way that there was going to be power in the body of Christ was for the body to be united, to come together, to come together in unity. And as we looked at in the first chapter, remember when Paul was talking about that, let there be no divisions amongst you? Remember how he was exhorting them to not let things come in amongst them that would cause problems? and keep them separated from each other. And specifically at that time, he was talking about them when one would say, I am from Apollos, or I am for Paul, or I am for Cephas. And others that were real spiritual said, yeah, but I'm Jesus. So, you know, I mean, that kind of thing. But Paul said, no, 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 no. It's not about the individuals. It's about who died for you on the cross. And if you let divisions come amongst you, whatever causes the division, then that unity of the body is damaged and it's dysfunctional. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here today as we look into what the body with many members has to do with unity and how when the unity is there, then there's effectiveness in the use of the gifts within the body of Christ, whether it's a local body or the universal body of Christ, speaking about all Christians throughout the whole world. But where it's displayed the most is in what we call the local bodies. In other words, the local groups of people that come together in Jesus Christ. Because remember, Jesus said, hey, we're two or, two or more gathered in my name. There I am in the midst, right? So right. what he's saying, it doesn't have to be, you know, it's not like you have to have at least 50 people before you really become a body of Christ. I mean, and just two people together serving the Lord in his name can be a unified body of Christ. Now, of course, you know, I mean, if you have more coming together, you can be more effective collectively as the body than two together. Okay. But I'm just saying two is biblically, two is enough to become a body of Christ. And so, so, I mean, when we, when we read this and we look at this, you know, understand what Paul's talking about today in the, what's left of 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about unity. He's talking exactly about what Jesus prayed to the Father uh, that we would all be when we came into relationship with him. So before I pray, that's what we're looking at today. That's kind of the picture we're looking at. Any questions, comments on that matter? Okay. By the way, Aaron, welcome. And Lynn, I don't think I welcomed you, and you've been here already a while. But, Thank uh, you, Ted. It's good to see everybody. Amen, brother. Yeah. Amen. Everything going well with you guys down there, Aaron? Everything's great. Thank you very much. Praise Amen. the Lord. Praise thank the Lord. Thank you. And Lynn, Amen. thank you for all you do, my sister. Amen. Okay. Well, let's Ted, pray. Ted, yeah. Yeah, Aaron, uh, how are you doing? Hey, doing well. Thank God. I was out working in the yard today, but then the rain started coming, so... I stayed out there, got wet for a while, but then I said, okay, that's enough getting wet. So then I came in. So, you know, like a, like a drowned dog, 
kind of thing, you know. <laughs> I was thinking drowned rat because yeah, I had just, okay. had just gotten home and I was getting ready to lock the back door and fix it all up because it was raining. And then here comes Ted, a drowned rat, and I might have locked him out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just would have ended up having to swim some more. But uh, <laughs> have you got your uh, pathology results yet? Not yet. Not yet. Um, this Thursday will be two weeks. So tomorrow will be two weeks. So I imagine they'll probably give me a call then. But hey, praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear your results came back, you know, in, in good yeah, shape. Apparently there's a, I had a confusion because they said, we call you if it's bad. Right, right. I thought it was no, if it's bad, we'll wait to tell you the bad news in two weeks. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah. I made that point with them. I said, well, that wasn't very clear. So I was thinking since you didn't call me, I was preparing for the operation and having to poop in a bag. <laughs> oh, man. They call it like a coloscomy? Some yeah, coloscomy. Yeah, if they have to cut out part of your insides and so yeah. oh yeah it's another. not a fun bring them process. to the outside and, yeah it's not oh, a fun oh, you process. poor thing that you were looking forward to that no, <laughs> uh, no. i wouldn't use that term but yeah that, no. was what, that was weighing on my mind because that was my understanding right they can't right. normally you think they don't tell you bad news over the phone so they always want you to come in so they can charge you extra fees and all yeah. that stuff well too, nowadays but, they they just tell you over the phone and charge you the extra fees yes. on top of that <laughs> so they, they, they got the gig worked out now they you know, yeah. they could just do it on the on the zoom yeah they, was, it, uh, it's yeah it's a given now yeah, yeah. insurance <laughs> companies or united healthcare is allowing the zoom meetings now yeah there you go okay well let's pray and we'll jump in Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together to study your word. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just open up our hearts and minds through your Holy Spirit and that we would understand what you are trying to tell us. And let us not just become intellectual believers, Christians, but let us become active, you know, Christians that reflect what we learn from your word and that we live it in a way that brings you honor and glory. So let us be attentive to what it is that you want to teach us today and that we put it into practice in a way that brings you honor and glory. We love you, dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. Let me let Martin back in here. I think he finally got inside the house now. So, uh, so we're going to jump in now and we're going to talk about work. Just remember, the transition from last week to this week is that now we are, we know about the giftedness. We know about the fact that we receive gifts when we come into the body of Christ, at least one gift through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is that you have to understand too, is that as you put God's calling into practice, as the Holy Spirit leads, Sometimes he may have you do something outside of your gifted area, but guess what? God gifts you when he calls you to do something and you step out in faith to go do it for him. If God's the one calling you to do it, he will give you the ability to do it. It's called equipping. God equips those he calls to do whatever he calls you to do. And sometimes equipping may be outside of the body of Christ. Like God may call you to go be a missionary to Podunk, Alaska. I don't know if, if that's a place. But, um, but if God calls you to go there, he and you step out in faith to go do what he's asked you to do, he will equip you. And in some cases, that may be giftedness, that may be with skills, it may be with something. A lot of times we tend to say, I can't be a missionary for the Lord because I haven't been to seminary, or I haven't been through this process, or I haven't gotten ready for it. But what you find is the people that God uses the most and the best are those that say, yes, Lord, here am I, send me. You know, because when you go back into Isaiah chapter 6, you remember how when Isaiah was being commissioned and that he stood before the Lord and he said, but I'm a man of unclean lips and I've got all these issues and, you know, why it should be that I can't do this for you. The Lord, the, remember that angel, the Lord came and touched him with a hot coal in his tongue and he said, hey, don't worry. Finally, as you read down a little further, Isaiah finally said, here am I, Lord, send me. 
See, that's what the Lord wants to hear. That finally, at some point, we say, it's not about me. It's about you and what you want. And whatever that requires, whatever that entails, whether I've got training or anything or not, go back and look at Jeremiah's commission at the very beginning, chapter one, chapter two, where he's saying, wait a minute, I'm, I'm just a kid. You know, what are you doing calling me? And I'm just a kid. I can't go do that stuff. Come on. But when you look at, at the point where all of these people that God called, at the point where they surrendered, and it's not to say that they didn't go through some troubling times in the process of doing their prophetic work that God had put them into, but look at the wonderful things that God used them to do in the process, right? And believe me, he can do, if he could do that then, he does it today too. But the thing is, we have to say, Lord, it's not about me. Here am I. I'm a vessel for your use. Here am I. Send me. And when we do that, he can use us. Okay. And he will, as a matter of fact, he will use us to his honor and glory. So think about that too, as we're going through what he's talking about here in the body of Christ, that we need to be ready. But the big takeaway from the lesson today, think unity of the body of Christ. I mean, don't think about individuals, but think unity. Because one last point, I've made this point in some of the classes for those of you who have been with me over time. But remember, when the Lord calls us into, into unity, um, and I just lost my train of thought because <laughs> I'm getting senile. And, uh, <laughs> but when I remember it, I'll bring it back up because it applies, okay? And uh, so for those of you who are watching the video, hey, just fast forward. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but anyway, let's go ahead and share out the screen here and, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, let's look at, uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we're gonna pick up in verse 12. Okay, he says, for just as the body is one. Okay, right off the bat, notice what he says. It doesn't say the body is made up, you know, all these individuals to be their own people. But he says, just as the body is one and has many members, and now he's talking about our physical body, okay? He's talking about, hey, when you look at your body in the mirror, it's not a blob, right? I mean, when you look at the uh, unless it's Ted, but if you look, <laughs> it depends on the day. Yeah, exactly. There you go. But when you look at yourself in the mirror, you've got hands, right? You've got digits, fingers, you've got, you know, arms extend, right? You have legs and you've got other things that keep the body going that you don't see because they're on the inside. Okay. So think that's what Paul is using as a metaphor as he's talking about the body, okay? That the body isn't just a blob, but the body has articulating members. It's got all kinds of different individuals that perform functions, but if they're not united, then what good are they because they're not contributing to the functions of the body, you know, as we, have a body and each piece that's attached to us has a function. And so that's, that's the metaphor he's using. So he says, just as the body is one and has many members, our, our physical body, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, okay? So each piece, it's not like you can set your hand off aside and say, I'm not gonna put it on today. You know, it's part of you, right? You can't detach it you know, without actually maiming the body. So he's saying, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. So think about it. When, when we are looking at, you know, the giftedness of the Holy Spirit and what he does in the individuals that are part of the body, that giftedness and those individuals are there to be united as one. If you try to be gifted but are not part of a body, then the gift is, has no power behind it because the gift works in unity, okay? The gift isn't something to be used separately and say, okay, I've got my gift so I don't have to go to church and I don't have to, you know, be involved with anybody. 
I can be a good enough Christian all by myself up on the top of Mount Everest and I'm good to go. No, nope, don't have to worry about it, right? Well, see, that's not what God calls us to. What we are called to in Christ is to be a united body in, under the Lordship who is the head, Jesus Christ, okay? For look at what he says in verse 13, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So that means that the Holy Spirit isn't just on the individual, but the Holy Spirit actually is there to give health to the body as well in unity. A lot of times we just tend to think of the Holy Spirit in us as an individual, but actually Oh, here's where my senility kicked in before. So whoever is fast forwarded to this point, now you'll know what it was I was thinking. But uh, the issue is this, that I just lost sync again. But anyway, uh, <laughs> these are cliffhangers, by the way, okay? So, <laughs> so as we are there in Christ for one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, okay? We're all one, we're all a unity, we're all together in Christ, and so for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slave are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, this piece right here fits within the problem that we're having in our nation today. See the problem? See the issue? In the body of Christ, there can't be prejudice. There can be absolutely none for everybody is equal in the body of Christ. In God's eyes and in God's sight, there is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free. They are all one in the body of Christ. And see, that's a problem that we do have today. A lot of times we have Christians saying, well, nah, not so much, right? But in today's day, we have to be careful with that. Uh, I'm writing down what uh, I was having senility with, um, but uh, the cliffhanger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all were made to drink of one spirit. So think about it. If we somehow try to say, look at all the denominations we have of Christians today, just in our nation alone. How many denomina Christian denominations do you think are out there? Tens, hundreds, Too many. thousands, thousands, thousands. That's right. Now, okay. does that show unity when nope. we tend to have it, things nope. that divide us? No, nope. no, it doesn't. But that's our human nature, isn't it? Because, and that's part of our pride that actually causes those divisions that causes these different denominational bents. It's because we say, I'm right in the way I'm interpreting the Bible here, or I'm right in the way I see things in my walk or my theology. And, and you're wrong. And you're wrong, and there is yeah. no way that you and I can get together as the body of Christ because we don't agree. See, the issue? See, that's how Satan loves to break up and cause dysfunction within the body of Christ, okay? Now... Here is what my senility, I mean, my cliffhanger issue was. That's bringing you to this point. In the, in the New Testament, well, actually, in the Old and New Testament, one of the thing in the Greek is that a lot of times, as we Americans, since we live in an individualistic culture, we tend to read when it says you. We tend to read that it's talking to me individually, okay, in the Bible. Actually, the majority of times that the Bible speaks, especially in the New Testament, when it says you, he's not speaking to you individually on, in most cases. He's speaking to you as a united body of Christ, as a collective unity, as a family of God, okay? He's not talking to each individual specifically, but we tend to read it through those lenses. We tend to say, oh, he's saying that about me, and the thing the problem that we have when we read that into what the writer is saying is that we tend to say it's okay for me to be separate from the others because he's speaking to me and only me when he says you in the Bible.
But see, Paul's bringing it out more than just the you. He's saying that we are many in the body, okay? And that we are all baptized into one body. That means, baptized means coming in together, okay? Baptism, getting unified together as one, into one body, regardless of what our ethnicity or what our, you know, um, uh, not just ethnicity, but race or ideals or individual thoughts. He's saying we're all equal. <clears throat> And we're all one, and we're made to drink of one spirit if we're in Christ. There's only one body in Christ, and only one Holy Spirit who is who God sent to be who drives us, to gives us the power to be his children, okay? That's what he's talking about here. And that's, he's bringing this up because he's talking about the giftedness up here, okay, that the Holy Spirit gives. And what the function of the Holy Spirit is in the body as a whole, okay? So he says, for the body does not consist of one member. And that's the point I've been making from that, those first couple verses there, verses 12, well, verses 12 and 13. It's not about each individual having his own agenda going on in a church body. He's saying, but of many, it's all of us aggregately together in the power of the Holy Spirit that make up the body with Christ as the head. If we're to say, I don't need to be that part of the body, or I can go out and live on my own and not be part of the body, then we're missing the whole point of what the Holy Spirit's role is in the unity and bringing together of the body of Christ. So, then he jumps back into the metaphorical way of thinking, right? He says, okay, if you don't understand what I'm talking about now, let me, let's, let's look at a, a, a human body and, and say, okay, how can it be functioned? If I have a body, a human physical body, how can it be a functioning body? And then draw that contrast with how the spiritual body in the body of Christ needs to be. He says, if the foot should say, and now he's basically giving it, what's it called when you give uh, life to something that's inanimate or something like that? It's, there's a word for that. Um, anyway, yeah, maybe maybe it'll conception. hit. What's that? That's conception? No, no, there's a, there's a word for where you animate something that, actually basically it's sort of like when we're talking about animals and we try to give them human things that they love us and we don't know but and so there's a word for that yeah i know if i remember it i'll throw it out but anyway he said yeah, it either i know what you're mean? trying to i know what you're trying to say and i can't think of it either yeah i know there's attributes well it, it's an attribute but i mean there's another word but but anyway sorry sorry i'm distracting you guys <laughs> <laughs> he says, for the, body does, for the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, huh, well, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. Think about how dysfunctional our body would be if we had the hand fighting with our foot or with, you know, some other part of our body and saying, mm, 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 mm. I'm not going to work for you today because I am not a foot. Forget it. It'd be I'm done. like one of the wheels on the Walmart cart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, I think Paul's kind of being a bit humorous here, you know. But but he's right because he's making his point, isn't he? Because he says, <laughs> "What if you did have, you know, your body appendages have have a mind of their own, and they say, well, 'Well, I'm not being treated as well as that foot, so that's it. I'm not doing anything.'" Forget you, you know, I don't care what you're going to do. I ain't doing nothing. And you <laughs> can't you? talk me into it. I got parts of my body that do that now. Well, see, that's okay. <laughs> well, we need to pray for you, brother. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, ladies, you need to work. <laughs> no, not today. <laughs> As we get older, right, today. we find that more a problematic issue. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, I think in a way, he brings a bit of humor into it, but it makes sense, right? He says, if the foot you say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body today, so forget you. 
that would not make it any le any less a part of the body. So in other words, if it acted that way or it could act that way, it still basically didn't say I'm detaching and going out on the town on my own today. You know, <laughs> when you have this hand walking out there, you know, you know, like it does in some of those weird hot horror science fiction movies, you know. But <laughs> cartoon. Yeah, or yeah, cartoon better. Yeah, let's go with cartoon. But <laughs> But it doesn't make the hand a less part of the body, right? And he, he uses it again. He uses the same type of contrast. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, what that would not make it any less a part of the body. In other words, so in other words, if one component part of your body said, like here, he says, if the whole body were an eye, you know, in other words, saying, you know, we even know today that probably the most, the sense we rely on the most is our visual sense, okay? For everybody that has all the sense, their senses, the, you, the eye is the one that we rely on the most for the most part, right? Right. But, so you can understand why he's saying if the whole body were an eye, because that's what we rely on most, what would happen when you needed to hear something? Where would the sense of hearing be, right? In other words, you'd be this one cyclop, right? one big eyeball out there, you know, somehow trying to get from point A to point B, but you got no arms, no legs, no, just an eyeball. Oh yeah, that would definitely be a way of being, right? So again, kind of humorous, right? You wouldn't even think, that's crazy, it's ludicrous to even think that way. And I think that's why Paul's trying to make his point. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be, right? An ear uh, all by itself is of no value without the others. If I so, had no legs, where would I go? Well, that's, there you go. See, <laughs> that's it, Doug. So, I mean, in other words, each one of these attributes is dependent on the others, right? So he's saying, but, that, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So when he created us, he created us in a way that is functional in every aspect. He made everything that we have, except for the appendix, uh, functional, <laughs> but actually, uh, the, actually the appendix does even still have a function, you know, I mean, not, not as big a function as it was intended, or uh, as we decided it was, or we, and when I'm talking we, scientifically. It's, uh, it's um, immune. It's from the immune system. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. so it's still has issues that it deals with, even though we treat it as if, oh, it's not that necessary anymore. I remember when I was younger, most parents had a, had their children have their appendix taken out just so that they wouldn't have to deal with a problem later on if they had an appendix infection or something. Oh, wow. wow. I never heard that. Uh -huh. Never heard that, buddy. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, our mom, our mom had noise. it taken out just to make sure she didn't have a problem. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there was a time when that was a mentality kind of thing. Yeah. Like with tonsils. Some people had their tonsils taken out so that they wouldn't have to deal with tonsillitis later on. So, I mean, these these are things that, you know, fit into, uh, you know, the way man thinks. But God created us as he arranged the members in our body, as he chose. That means they all have a functional purpose, okay, in our physical body. Draw the parallel in the spiritual body. So what God created for the spiritual body all have a function. We're not to lobotomize any part of our body of Christ just because we say, well, that, that one doesn't apply anymore today. But we tend to do that, don't we? In some cases, you see some churches that say that was for then, not now. And a lot of times that's how they get around obeying all of God's law because they say, well, that doesn't apply to us today. So we don't have to observe that because that was for then, not for now. And that's some of the reasons we see some denominations have cropped up on their own because they say this isn't required today. So we don't want to live it. So we don't we can't fellowship with these other Christian denominations because they still think that it should be functional in the body of Christ. So these are issues. These are human issues that we deal with when we tend to make, when we tend to want to interpret God's word 
our way and not through the Holy Spirit that we tend to want things our specific way. That we say, well, this applies, but this doesn't apply. Or this is okay, but this isn't okay. Or when you do cherry picking throughout the Bible and say, okay, I'll, I'll live by this, I'll live by this, and I'll live by this, but not this, not this, and not this, you know, that's, that's a human issue that we let get in the way. And believe me, Satan usually has a hand in that because he lies to you mm -hmm. And he says, Dad, don't worry about it. Isn't that what he did to Eve? Hey, you'll be just like God. All you got to do is just take a bite. And you'll be, man, you can know good from evil. Ooh, doggy. Oh, and look how much that's come to bite us in the, in the Try pack. it. You'll yeah. like it. Yeah, the exactly. Butt the buttocks. <laughs> there it you go. You need to bite us in a member. <laughs> Yeah, uh, an essential <laughs> member of the body. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> so these are real things that Paul is trying to bring up, right? So as, as God created us to be one as a physical body, then think about it spiritually. If all were a single member, where would the body be? Now he's talking about the body of Christ. If it was all about us being individuals, individualistic Christians, and I'll tell you what, he's talking about the church today, especially America, because this is a big problem we have in the church today. We've let the individualism of our culture, American culture, into our churches, and that's not what Christ has called us to. We're to be a collectivistic environment that models Christ in a united form not a bunch of individual Christians just attending a building to hear a message on Sunday. See, if we become individualistic, then where is the unity? Where is the coming together? It's like having a baby finger over here. It's like having a big toe over here. It's like having a foot over here, but we're not bringing the body together to be functional. And that's what Paul's trying to make in his point here is that we can't be individuals. We, if it were a single member, we, we'd be dysfunctional. We couldn't just be one eye. And I, everybody's like the same thing. What's that? Yeah. We'd be like Frankenstein with a lobotomy. That's it. We'd be dysfunctional. What's that What's, there, uh, what, Milt Martin? Uh, yes. Can you please explain the difference between uh, the gift of the spirit and a talent? Because people That's sometimes right. confuse a talent with a gift. That's right. Okay, a, a gift is a Holy Spirit endowed strength to build up the body of Christ. A talent is that ability that God gives to bring him worship and honor. And usually a talent can be used in the body, but it can be used outside the body. Now, a talent, it can be used to glorify God. Okay, and as a matter of fact, that's usually what we use our talents for, is in some ways to bring God honor and glory through worship or through abilities. And, but when it comes to giftedness, it's the Holy Spirit that endows us with a strength that is contributing to the unity of the body as that gift is put into practice. It's for a building up of the body. Does that answer that, Mark? For example, the person who has the ability to to sing, right. I believe that's not that's not a, a, a gift, but it's a talent. Right. And like you said, you can use it to uh, glorify God, but you can also use it to sing in the world. That's right. That's right. Well, our it, talents are our gifts are explained pretty clearly, I would say. And what's not explained in the gifts would be a talent. That's right. Well, just think about it this way: when we surrender to the Lord, what do we surrender to Him? Do we surrender everything or do yeah. we surrender some things? Because we see some Christians that don't surrender everything to the Lord. There are some things they want to keep for their own pride and their own ego. And a talent can be that. You can't use a Holy Spirit gift to live an ungodly life because the Holy Spirit is a God thing. Okay. You can go out and use your own abilities, your own skills to break fellowship with the Lord through sin, but that's not your gift, okay? Your gift is 
something that God has given for the unity and building of the body. It's a God thing. Okay. So yeah, there's, there's a difference in these things. The question is how much have you surrendered to the Lord and what are you using your giftedness for in the body or are you letting it just be dormant? See, because I mean, there's a lot of Christians out there today that stay dormant in their giftedness, right? There it is. Sally just used the right word. It's anthropomorphism. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jean. No, she was, yeah, she said that one, but I was trying to think of personification. Oh, both of them apply. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's when we try what, to put a human quality some inanimate object. What? One, one of the major problems that I see in the church saying, this is just me saying this. Yeah. But we've gotten to the point where the church is trying to figure out how it can fit itself into our lives instead of us trying to figure out how we can fit our lives into the church. So Good point. How, how often do you hear sermons on surrender? Yeah. Oh, we sing but, the we sing the hymn, don't I we? Surrender I surrender all. all. Right. <laughs> but but yet you don't you don't hear sermons on it. You don't hear you don't hear the, the preacher pumping you know, pounding the pulpit and right. and because they're afraid that they're going to offend somebody and they'll go to another church or they'll be offended and they'll leave. And it's like, yeah, but if you're telling the truth and they're offended by the truth and they leave. I don't see the I don't see the problem. Well, the issue is those are the itching ears kind of thing that I think uh, the, you know the Bible talked about that that at the end you, toward the end of time people are going to go looking for things you know that yeah. they want to hear, not that they want to change their lives. They just want to feel good about whatever message they're given. And the church ca is catering to that. And to some extent, we are. And I think yeah. one of the big issues is, is we're turning our churches into a business more than we are trusting God to do the work in drawing people as we go out and minister and right. carry out the good news as a united front to the people. It's well, the Holy Spirit that saves people, not us. Yeah. The Holy Andy Spirit is the one who convicts. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Jim? Uh, Andy, to your point, uh, it's shepherds of the flock, you know, the, it's someone's, their heart isn't convicted in that message. I, I think it's up to us, the members of the body, to lift the other members of the flock. And of course, the pastoral team, for example, our church, and I don't want to be critical. I, I want to speak, I want to speak with a tongue of positivity. Amen. Uh, the, uh, you know, we have a large pastoral team and, you know, sometimes if we aren't gifted in that care to that individual, we see that in the body, we should reach out to members of the pastoral team to do that. I mean, I come from churches where they, we get new members, we, they fill out the new member card, we'd greet them if they didn't, and we'd go visit their house, and we'd learn about them and welcome them and integrate them into the body with love. And right. when they Make wanted, them part of the family, right? And, and then when the family had, you know, a conviction in their heart that didn't understand, we also had tolerance and uplifting them in care, not letting them just walk out the gates and run out the gates and never come back. Right, right. Well, and I think that that's the big thing. If people that come in to our place don't see a unity and a loving, caring group of people, but all they see is about the same thing that they see on the streets, the only difference is that they hear this message or they hear this group we bring in because, well, they've got a name to them and that's how we think we're drawing people. Or we, call, we build a Starbucks so that we can try to bring people in. That's not... I mean, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying that that's not, what we're doing is we're trusting in things to somehow yep. be the draw when we need to be reaching out to them as individuals to build relationships because that's what God called us to do. We're to build relationships, not to attract them through indulgences, things that, you know, fit their fleshly needs, but we need to get there where their spiritual hunger is at. And I think sometimes we don't trust God enough, it seems like, so we do these things to try to bring them in. But to me, I think we need to be careful when we do certain things. I know our intentions are good, you know, where we bring in some big name group or speaker or something like that to try to bring them in. But we need to be careful that we're not 
reaching a person's, um, I don't know, pride center or their entertainment value or something like that. Because right. if we do that, then is there a spiritual hunger or a spiritual need we're actually reaching or addressing? Because that's what God wants us to do is get that good news to them. Let them know what Jesus is all about. And if we, if we do it through some type of manipulation, maybe they might, and, and then at the end of it all, we, we give this call to salvation. Are they doing it because their hearts and their spirit are really calling them? Or is it an emotional thing that they're reaching out to? They're saying, I want that. But really what they want is more entertainment. Um, I, right. I've read several books on the point, and it goes back even to the 1900s on several authors. And they said, one of the common threads that I hear is the way the person gets saved is what their expectation of salvation will be throughout their lives. So in other words, if you brought them into salvation because you brought this great group in, that's what they're going to be looking for as their satisfaction throughout their spiritual development. In other words, they'll leave churches, go to others. If they find a church that has a better entertainment factor that fits that need that they had and why they were saved. Um, well, so, well then, you, then you would have to question the, the veracity of their salvation. Well, there is no salvation. That's the issue. And, and, and it all starts with preaching the whole counsel of God. Absolutely. The, the, the good parts, you know, right. God's loving kindness, God's toler or God's patience with us. You know, he, he's, he's long patient and, you know, he's slow to anger and he's quick to forgive. But there's also other parts that you have to preach that are that fear of the Lord. Yes. Okay. Sin is still sin and, and you have to preach against it. And you just don't hear that anymore. And it's yeah. because churches are afraid of turning people off. Right. Well, and, and that ties into the whole entertainment thing. Well, and I think, I think about, I mean, they're interconnected. Yeah, that well, goes back to discipleship. I think more than anything. I mean, as a body, we we have to be accountable in in, in, in training and equipping. And and, and and that's another place where we're falling down because absolutely. you know we say okay, well, life groups can be discipleship groups. Right. They can be, but a lot of times they're not. Right. Well, and I think one of the things that we fall short in is we don't tell people to count the cost in following Christ. A lot of times they have a certain expectation that everything's going to be rosy and peachy because that's kind of what we say. I mean, you know, we'll give a good message, like the pastor will give a good message, but then he'll just say, okay, now if you feel like, you know, God really wants you, say this prayer after me. And then immediately after that, they say, okay, now you're saved and you're going to heaven. Your name's written in heaven. You don't got to worry about a thing from now on. But the question is, was their heart right? I mean, to, uh, for us to categorically make a statement like that about a person, we may be leading them down the wrong path. Maybe their heart wasn't right, but they thought it was. They thought, hey, I said the magic prayer, so I've got my card. I'm good to go. Yeah, and they like, think, like an incantation. Hey, and the, nowhere in the Bible do we have a special prayer that you say no. that brings you into relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not sure we that have to from. accept him and what he did for us because he's the only way only through Jesus Christ is there salvation. And yep. do we get that across right? Do we get that message across right so that the person we're leading to the Lord understands the commitment, the value and what it is that they're reaching out to in terms of receiving that gift of salvation. But let's and not Jesus, forget that every gift is the Holy Spirit will ignite in them. And it's absolutely, absolutely. Go ahead there, Mark. Yeah, I, my opinion is that I, I, in general, this is not about our church again. This is uh, Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that most of the pastors, most of the churches today are more interested in pleasing people than honoring God. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And see, Yep. That's a drawback, because what do we go by in churches right now to say if they're effective? If they have good music. Good music. Good point. The amount of money. Look how big Mo the How much is. money are they bringing in? 
look at our size of our membership. Our membership number. It's all. It's all words. Numbers. That's right. Baptisms. How many baptisms have yep. you had? Um, it's all about numbers, and I, we got to be careful about numbers, because I mean, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to make this amount of numbers. You know, it's about bringing well, the gospel the of Christ. We're What's that, we're, not that, we're not doing that saving. You know, that's Christ. It's not our works. That's right. And see, uh, that's what we're measuring it by. We're putting metrics on it like as if yeah. it's my accomplishment right. in it or it, it, this this organization's accomplishment in yeah. it. If you're on that corporation at the end of the year, yep. you want to see the amount of sales. <laughs> well, obviously, exactly. you want to increase your sales. So Absolutely. unfortunately, some people run their church like a corporation. It's all about numbers. And, and I'll tell you what. I, most organizations, most denominations out there do it that way today. And that's not what we're called to, because it's not about us doing it. It's not about the numbers. Remember in the Old Testament when King David went to go put out a census? And what did God do? Man, he said, uh, and remember, Joab even told him, don't do this. God will take care of us. He'll provide everything we need. Don't, this is not what you want to do. And God was testing David. David went out and took the census anyway. And look at what God's punishment was, because it's about trusting God. It's not about trusting numbers. Because remember, even when he sent out, um, uh, what was the name of the guy that uh, took 300 with him instead of 20,000, 30,000? Uh, Gideon? Gideon. Remember when Gideon? went out, you know, he was reluctant. He had all kinds of worries and everything, but God said, I'm not going to send you with 30, 40, 50,000. I'm going to send you with these 300 that haven't, you know, that scooped up water in the worst kind of way. That's who I'm sending with you. So it's not about numbers. And God once says, I do it this way, because then that way you can't say it was you guys that did it. it That's a condition I, of the heart. That's exactly it. And that's what it all comes down to. Are we reaching the heart of these people? Not egos, not flesh, not personal desires, but are we getting the message across that hits their heart? Because that's what needs to change, right? Mm -hmm. Can you remind me again what the spiritual gifts are, please? Well, I mean, the ones, if you go up here to, ver I mean, these, remember, like I said last week, this this is not an exhaustive list because I took you into Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. But here's the ones that he gives in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So, in other words, the Holy Spirit brings it about for the common good, the unity. To one is given the Spirit of the utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge, uh, faith, Gifts of healing, in other words, there are more than one. Apparently, there are different levels of that. The working of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and all of these all come under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list. Anything that God gives a member of the body of Christ that builds up the body of Christ and is something that's there on a regular basis and it's something you enjoy doing is a gift from the Spirit, okay? It's not something that he gives you so that you can go out and make yourself $20 billion for your own use, okay? Now, saying that, though, God does give gifts of ability to make money and those people that God gives those gifts actually go out and make money and they give back to the church the majority of it. Okay. Stewardship. Exactly. It's stewardship. It's, it's part of that. So there are some that God allows them to do that, but they don't have, you know, they're, they're not like the, the rich young ruler that came to Jesus that said, what must I do to be saved? But he still wanted to hold on to his money and his stuff. You know, it's, those people that God, Jesus, I think Colgate was one of them, for instance, that he lived on 10% everything he made. 90% went to missions and to churches and to meeting the needs of others. See, that is a gift of generosity. And God gave him the ability to be able to make this big corporation. But 
the money that he made went to serving others. And to the dip to point to that, it's not the prosperity gospel. It's the prosperity of God's money and the stewardship of God's money, that's not right. the stewardship of our money. That's right. And see, that's a twist that Satan puts in there to try to draw people away. Because when you, when you look at the prosperity gospel, what is it satisfying? The, the flesh. flesh. That's right. It's not satisfying the unity of the body or the love reaching out to others. It's satisfying your own ego desires, your flesh, your wants. And it's kind of like using God as this, you know, this sugar daddy that he's going to give me whatever I want because, hey, look, I gave him some of my money. So he's going to give me back a whole bunch more. That's, that's trying to manipulate God. We don't manipulate God. It's not going to work. Interesting. Sorry, Victor. Go ahead. Is this where that person Ananias came in? Well, that's exactly where it came in, right there. Satan used Ananias and Sapphira to try to disrupt. That was the initial infighting of Satan coming into the church to disrupt the church body and church unity. Absolutely. That's what he did. Notes it was saying they were giving value to some of the, the gifts and they were denigrating some of the gifts. So I'd be curious to know which ones they think were, you oh, know. we're getting to that. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. I mean, we're getting <laughs> to that because, see, see, that's the problem. A lot of times, even though we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? We still have our own pride and our own desires, right? Well, that's what the church at Corinth had. And it, it will apply to us. Some people say, oh, but I want a gift that makes me better than all the other Christians. <laughs> when you get that mentality, that's not God. Yeah. That's your flesh work. That's that, the part of the body that's the pain in the neck. That's, that's where <laughs> Satan is getting in there and trying to disrupt the unity of the body. Because then, hey, how many Christians have you known that, boy, they'll tell you about how much they study the Bible. How much they, you know, have read the Bible. How much they know. You know what I'm saying? And what is that? That's somebody that is saying they need to read the Bible again. That's the issue. Because they need, they've obviously missed some of the fundamentals of what it is to follow Christ, which is humility, abasing oneself, meekness. You know, that's, they've missed those character values of Christ when they're trying to exalt themselves as a better Christian than the others. Nobody is a better Christian than anybody else. We're all mm-hmm. sinners, right? And and there's, yeah, there's go ahead, no Mark. good Christians. There's no bad Christians. There's only Christians. <laughs> That's right. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, listen, as we know, you know, uh, the gift of the spirit, they are, they are gifts that are more visible. As you know, you got the pastor, you got teachers, you got evangelism and so on. Right. And you got all the gifts that are basically behind the scene. Right. Like the gift of mercy. Right. Now, uh, is it is it right for a Christian to be discontent with the gift that he has? Say, oh, listen, I, I can't preach like so and so, or I cannot teach like so and so. Would that be uh, would that that's be a, a sin? sin. Or? That's a sin because actually we'll get to that a little later because he says Paul says don't compare yourselves amongst yourselves. And it's a lot longer litany than that, but the outcome of not comparing yourselves because it is not wise, because what is it looking for when you're trying to say, I want to be a Billy Graham? Well, maybe that may not be God's plan for you. God's plan for you is to be who God made you to be. Amen. But a lot of times our pride says, I want to be better than so-and-so. Well, if that's God's plan, fine, but that's not a right attitude to have in the process of going into it, because everything that God wants us to be, and it's just like Martin is indicating, it's about humility. It's about coming into him. Who's the one that brought up surrender? Was that you, Andy? Yeah. Surrender. It's about being a vessel chosen for his use, right? If we're not there, then what value are we, right? We've got to be there for his use, for the Holy Spirit's use, not for our own benefit or our own gain. That's, if if you're going down that road, we're letting the flesh get involved. And man, that's, that's why last week we were talking about, you've got to die to the flesh daily. 
Because if you don't, that little flesh loves to get in there and say, look at, look at Ananias and Sapphira, right? Hey, we can make money off of this one. Nobody will be the wiser. And they lied to God, and both of them died because they kept lying, right? Yep. And that's how Satan gets in there, is he loves to twist things to the benefit of the flesh, which is what Jim was talking about earlier. You know, this health and wealth and prosperity gospel. That's not what God has called us to, mm -hmm. right? So look, uh, so we're all, God has arranged us as he chose. If all were single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many member, there are many parts, yet one body. So when it all comes down to it, I think one of the big parts of the message we miss today when we are bringing people into the body of Christ, we need to be united first. And then we need to be able to show them the beauty of coming into the unity of the body, not a bunch of individuals and just say, okay, you're your own person now. Yeah, hallelujah, I'm glad you came. Now, now we can add one to our numbers, you know, of those that made a profession of faith, because that's what we call it. How many have made a profession of faith? We don't say that they were really saved or anything. because That's not our call, right? It's God's call. Right. He's the one that writes their name in heaven, not us. And so that's what he's talking about. So Paul, I don't think Paul could be more solid in terms of indicating what the necessity of unity is if we're going to be effective as the body of Christ. Because that's what he's talking about here, folks. He, and that's why he's bringing in this metaphor of the body and the dysfunction of the body. If it's not collectively united as one, one element, our bodies are non-functional. If it was to be separate or if the body was just one piece and that's all it ever was. So he's making that same point with the whole body of Christ. We are of no value if we're not united together. I mean, we may be saved as individuals. But if we're not coming together, we're not carrying out the mandate Christ has for us to be united as he and the Father are united as one. Any, any questions, comments on that? Uh, Can you say the body is not united when you trip and fall? Now, the reality is we're in a sinful world. There mm -hmm. is going to be issues where somebody stumbles. You know that there's going to be something out there that a body, a member in the body stumbles with. But see, that's where the beauty of a united body of Christ comes in. Because what happens? The, when the body comes together, if a brother or sister stumbles, they go grab onto them right away and they lift them up. And right. they say, I'm here for you, brother. I'm here for you, sister, to help you through this tough time. And we're here to help you get over whatever the issue is that caused them to stumble. But what do we do today when we find out that somebody's struggling with homosexuality in the body of Christ? Oh, stay away from me. I, you know, I might catch it if I end up interacting with you or try to help you get over this or work through this issue so that you can be, you know, conformed to the way Christ wants you to be. A lot of times today we've got certain phobias to certain types of sins that we say, well, I'm just not going to get involved with that person because, man, that person's got this weird worldview or something like that. Well, that's not what we're called to. In the body of Christ, we're called to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. That means we are supposed to be so tight together that, hey, if anybody is stumbling or having an issue or crying or mourning, we should be right there with them and our giftedness is to get them out of that situation and to be there with them and for them in love in the process. Iron and then, iron. Amen. And then when they come out of it, we rejoice with them collectively because God did the work. And scripture says that we are to gently restore them, being careful not to fall into the same sin ourselves. Amen. But, but we are to bear, the, bear burdens with them and we are to gently restore them. If, Amen. And if they don't want to be restored, then there's not much you can do. But, you know, we do have to try to but we be still careful reach not to out do it to them. In so restoration is through prayer, through Christ and repentance. Amen. Amen. But yes. collectively, we carry that out through the body of Christ. James chapter 5 talks about that, right? <laughs> 
that we should be able, I mean, we should be so tight as the body of Christ to where I can confess my sins to Ad, Andy, for instance. And I can say, hey, Andy, my brother, man, I was weak. Yeah, <laughs> I hear nothing. I see nothing. Yeah, how's that monkey thing go? I say nothing. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but we should be so tight as the body of Christ to where we understand each other's foibles and I should be able to, you know, address my sin to Andy and say, hey, brother, I was weak this week and I had this issue that I was dealing with. Man, I need your prayers. I need your support. I need your help to be able to overcome this issue. And it's what does James chapter five say? And the prayer of the sinner will basically, you'll be forgiven for confessing to others in the body. And you say, why am I forgiven if I confess it to Andy? Because we're one body. We're all connected. Christ is the head. So by confessing to each other, it's kind of like if I put a Band-Aid on this finger, I'm healing the body, you know, because my head understands. And it's sending, you know, the antibodies to make sure I don't get an infection. Well, that's the same way it works in the body of Christ. If I confess to Andy and we're united in Christ through the Holy Spirit, Christ is automatically healing that body and forgiving that body as we confess to one another. I think people are afraid to do that. Well, they in the our culture, don't do it. And in our culture, to, man, we don't want it on Facebook the next day, right? Hey, look what they're, they're afraid to do it because of number one, yeah. judgment, and number two, rejection. Yeah, you know yeah. that shame factor. And it Ted, do you think the next day? Shoot, we're tweeting it out as soon as you're saying it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Right, right. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah. Uh like the Bible said, you know, the, the gift of the spirit is, is to is to build to edify the church. But as you know, there's some seen preachers out there that they basically they manipulate their gift, saying, Okay, for example, you got some preachers out there that say they claim to have the gift of, of healing. So they all say, Okay. Uh, come tonight and you will be healed. So, uh, I mean, I've seen this in churches. Oh, I People have will come, yes, you're, telling, you're telling me I'm going to be healed, so I'm expecting to be healed tonight. So what? I go out there, right? The, the preacher's praying for me, but I come out, I, I'm not healed. Right. But people are disappointed because you promised them, especially those who don't, don't, are not Christian, that they're going to be healed. Right. That's a guarantee. Right. So in a way, like the Bible said, because of them, the, the unbelievable uh, uh, blaspheme God, because they're saying, okay, this guy just lied to me. He promised me healing. And, and again, so they're using the gift not to bring glory to God, but to right. glorify themselves. Well, and the question is, do they even really have the gift in the first place? Right. I mean, but, because... But I mean, even if you have it, as you know, you might have the gift of... of uh, like I was just reading about uh, uh, right. Paul. Look, Timothy didn't get healed. What was that Paul told Timothy? Well, drink some wine. because yeah. how, come, how come he had a problem? There's all the cases that not everybody got healed. Right. Well, look at Paul himself. He had an eye problem. You know, and why wasn't he healed as a great follower of God? Remember, even the Galatians said, hey, I'd swap out my eyes for you if I could. You know, I mean, but yet God didn't heal him. So, I mean, we can't just look at things like God is this guy that's going to do everything we want him to do for us. Sometimes he needs us to be surrendered to him in such a way that no matter our situation, we still keep our eyes on him, regardless. Because then it's not about us. That's what Martin's trying to bring out. It's not about us. It's about him and his plan, his purpose, and what brings God to glory. Not what brings us ego building or anything like that. Because it's not about us in the process of doing it. It's about him. Right? So that's important. And I think we need to keep that in mind. Because God's not this, you know, this sugar daddy up there just wanting to, you know, like he's holding back until, oh, yeah, I want to give Ted everything he ever wanted. I want to give him glory. That's what it comes down to. It's not about yeah. material possessions or anything like that. What can I do to say, I'm yours, Lord. I'm your son. And I want to bring you honor and glory as my heavenly father. That's what it comes down to. And that's the real thing. So look at, look at where Paul goes over here in verse 21. And he's continuing. 
can the, uh, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, and this is what we were talking about before, you know, when we were talking, was that you that said it, Martin, where some people are, have less visible gifts, you know, he said, yes. on the yeah. contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. A lot of times we tend to say, oh, well, the pastor has this leadership gift. He has this, you know, elders kind of ability and whatnot. That's the more important guy that Paul's saying, hey. If you don't have the other people that are keeping the body united together as one, they may be weaker as far as we say from a gifted perspective, but they're indispensable. Without them, there's no body. Okay? And on the part of those parts of the body that we think less honorable, were we talking about the buttocks? Anyway, we bestow greater honor because we got to sit on that buttocks for a long time, right? <laughs> if we're going to a pew in the church, yeah, anyway, no, no, and uh, <laughs> what are we doing now? We don't realize how important it is till we go to sit on it and we've got a boo boo back there and it oh. hurts to sit. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. You know, and he says, so, <laughs> so he says, and those less honorable, we bestow greater honor and our, un and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which are more presentable, with, with our, which our more presentable parts do not require. So, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division. And here we go back to this again. No division in the body, uh, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And that's what it all comes down to, that we care for one another. And this is what I said earlier. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Hmm. If one member is honored, all rejoice together see that's something that is hard for us as people we try to say well i'll rejoice with you but man i'll be darned if i'm gonna go suffer with you okay you know you you take that one on your own and then but hey when everything's fine then call me and uh, man i'll be saying praise the lord man i was praying for you that everything would be fine you know but where were you when i needed you kind of thing you see the issue so in the unity, we're there for each other, you know, through health. I mean, it's almost like, you know, that marriage vow, through health or wealth and pros prosperity or whatever. And I haven't been married, so I don't know it very well. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that thing. In, in a sense, that's what you're doing. You're making that commitment to your brothers and sisters when you come into the body of Christ. And that's what we're called to do. We're to be there for them no matter the situation. We're no better than the other brother or sister, and they are no better than us. That's why we're all equal at the foot of the cross. And it's not about us saying it's about me. You know, you know I mean, that's, we tend to do that, though, don't we? We tend to try to segregate ourselves, say, I'm better than so-and-so, or I'm a better Christian, or look at everything I'm doing. But we've got to be careful with that because I think we have a lot of people in church today that look like good Christians. Man, they serve, they do all these things. But the reality is they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Man, we need to be careful about that because, I mean, that's what Jesus said. On that day, there's going to be the goats and sheep. The sheep are going to say, when did we do all these good works you're talking about? Because they just did it out of love for Christ. It wasn't something they felt obligated to do. They just did it to bring him honor and glory. But the others will say that Jesus said, wait a minute. Uh, they say, we did those things. We did all this for you. Look, we did it on your name. He said, yeah, but I never knew you. Get thee mm -hmm. from me, you know? And I mean, so, I mean, it's not about what we do trying to satisfy our own salvation, like as if the more we do, the more saved we are. Because all we had to do for salvation is just believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for us and then put our hand out and just say, I'm ready to receive that gift. That's it. I mean, it's a gift. There's nothing we can do that is going to make us any more saved than we are at that point in time. But if there is no transformation, no heart change, 
then that should be a reason to go out and check your salvation with fear and trembling. Because th there's got to be a heart change in it. It's got to be something that says, I no longer am looking to the things of the flesh, but I'm looking to the things of the spirit. And so that's where we need to be in the process of all of that, right? So right. we need to be mm -hmm. there in unity, looking out for each other. So mm -hmm. look at verse 27. He says, now you are the body of Christ. Now he's bringing it all together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Okay. And I think that that's, that's the key verse right there. You are the body of Christ. It's not about individuals. It's not about breaking yourselves up. It's not about being better than any of the other, but collectively you are the body of Christ and individuals tied together of it. And he says, and God has appointed in the church. And then look, he kind of puts an order. He's not saying you're better than others. He's just putting an order of how these things work. Okay. He's saying it, he, God has appointed in the church first apostles. Now we don't really have apostles in the sense of what they had back then. The apostles back then were the sent ones. You know, the 11 disciples were apostles and Paul was counted as an apostle and mm -hmm. a, Matthias was voted in as an apostle. Okay. You don't hear much about Matthias these days, but, <clears throat> but anyway, he says, so there are apostles. Second, there are prophets. Third, teachers. Then miracles. Today, prophets are like our pastors, our leaders, okay? They're the ones that exhort the scriptures and bring them to us, okay? Third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping. So he's putting in order these kinds of gifts that come in and are used within the body in an orderly fashion, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. In other words, are all apostles? In other words, is everybody an eyeball? No. Are all prophets? Is everybody a hand? No. Or an ear, right? Are all teachers? Is everybody a foot? No. Do all work miracles? No. In other words, do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But he says, earnestly desire the higher gift. Desire doesn't mean you're going to get them because God's going to give them to those that he feels I mean, the Holy Spirit's going to put it on those that he feels are the best able to be able to carry them out for the equipping of the body, okay? So we trust that the Holy Spirit's going to do his work. And he says, I will show you still a more excellent way. In other words, the more excellent way isn't our way. It's God's way. It's trusting the Holy Spirit in everything that he wants, everything that he has a desire for in each individual body. That's how it works out. And if we trust him and we follow him, then we start having what is called a healthy church. Not a dysfunctional church, but a healthy church. And that's where I think a lot of churches are so lean and weak today is because they don't follow everything. They don't have the unity. They don't have the surrender that Andy was talking about. The, they don't have the humility. They have the self-serving, individualistic Christian desires in a body. And that causes separation, not unity. Because when you're competing, because that's what it becomes, you're competing for things, then you're not, when you're competing, there's no unity in competition. Because if I'm competing with Andy, I want things my way. I don't want them Andy's way. If I'm competing with Martin, I want him my way, not Martin's way, right? Because if it's Martin's way, then it's not satisfying my own personal desire or idiosyncrasies. So that's where the problem lies. That's why it can't be about competition. It can't be about what I'm better than anybody else. It can't be about pride. It can't be about egocentrism. It's got to be about surrender, humility, you know, meekness. It's about looking to God and all, and all surrender to him, letting him use us collectively as the body that he intends us to be. And when we do that, man, we can make a significant difference in this world. But if we don't, we're only going to have partial successes 
because God can only do what you know we've let him do. If we're saying we're a vessel surrendered for his use, but only in these areas, then we're not being used to the full accomplishment of what God wants to be able to use us as the effective body united uh, with him. You see what I'm saying? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. What would be, okay, if uh, in Pentecost, uh, by the speaking in tongue was languages, right? So when it says there, uh, various kinds of tongue, will you be able, will that be a different languages today? I think it's both. Um, I think it's not just languages, it can be languages. I've read several books on missionaries that have gone into some of these areas in, in, in the 1900s, okay, that have gone into different areas of the world. They didn't know the language of the people where they were going. And yet through the Holy Spirit, they were able to interact with these people. And there were people that came to salvation through God's use. So there is that type of language. But I think there is also a heavenly language that God uses. But I think we need to learn from Paul on that language. I'm not saying God can't use that language to his honor and glory. But Paul said, I'd rather use, you know, five words in a language that somebody can understand than 10,000 words in a heavenly language that nobody understands. But yet he says, I know I speak more in that language than y'all. But he said, but it's basically not something that you bring into the body to flaunt. Like, look at me. I can speak, you know, God has this heavenly language. Well, what good is that? Is it doing you any good in the process? And if it's not, then you got an issue, right? So we need There's to... There's wisdom in being humble. Well, that's it. Well, then it's about serving your own desires, not serving his desires. And we need to be careful mm -hmm. with that because he's going to be talking to the Corinthians later about them taking gifts out of context, that they want these other gifts because they think it makes them better than the others. And it's kind of what Martin's talking about here. We need to be careful how the gifts are used, that the gifts are definitely used to build up the body. Hey, the Holy Spirit will gift us in the gifts that are needed in that body to bring them closer together and to meet the needs of that body. I, know, I, I personally have seen a person abuse <laughs> uh, that gift. It, oh, absolutely. It's a gift of language. I mean, uh, that one of the tongues. Even, even uh, if, if you're on the, pro, uh, on the radio, why are you speaking in what they call it tongues? If no one understands. Right. That's between you and God. Right. And, and basically, it became like, okay, if you can speak in tongues, I mean, you're, you're more spiritual than anybody else. That's, there it goes. Yeah. It's about that pride thing, Martin. But yes, I've been in Pentecostal churches for a good portion of my life. I've been in Foursquare, and I've been in First Assembly of God. Um, and I'll tell you, in the Foursquare church, they taught you how to speak in tongues because to them, that was a reflection of your salvation. See, in other words, they were teaching you how to speak in tongues, in a heavenly tongue. Well, wait a minute. Where's the Holy Spirit in this? You know, and, and well, the issue, also, it's not scriptural because no, of course not so. everybody not everybody has the gift of tongues. Right. Only Remember? some people. Only some people are not everybody's gifted with it. Some people are gifted with it. Other people with with uh, prophecy, other people with evangelism. Right. So if you right. don't speak in tongues, that doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's right. But and see, they really see, that seems to be a real benchmark for them. Well, but That's see, it. remember I was telling you about what causes divisions and, uh, and different denominations? Yeah. Those are the types of things that cause them because they're yeah. not right. Go ahead, Martin. It goes on, it's going on today. Oh, it's absolutely. Going on church. There's plenty of churches that are going on. Okay. The thing is, if that's to edify the church, instead of edifying the church or glorifying God, it basically becomes a show. I'm not, I'm, I'm the, in this case, I am judging. Yes, I am judging. Yeah, it becomes a show. Yeah. Well, and that's why those churches are called holy rollers. They were putting that moniker on them because, I mean, it's like, it's not that you can't, you know, praise the Lord with all your might. But when you start doing things that are kind of way out there, 
And where you're not really reaching people, you're just doing things, because that's what it comes down to. You've created these things. Yeah, you call them biblical, but, not in, but the way you're carrying them out is not biblical. There's a problem when man tries to do them in his own strength, because that's what the four square church was doing where I went. They were trying to carry out God's ordinances that the Holy Spirit was supposed to work, but they wanted to do it themselves. Well, they were giving him a help, some help. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure the Holy Spirit needs help, right? <laughs> but yes, that's, uh, I mean, because see, with them, you didn't qualify for their body of Christ if you didn't speak in tongues. So to them, to build up their body, they had to teach you. Yeah, you know, what? You know, teach me what? You know, I mean, if it's not the Holy Spirit, then what am I even doing here? You know, and that's. That's what it came down to, you know? So I didn't spend much time in the four square gospel church there. So, because I mean, it biblically, it didn't fit. And so, and, and it's amazing how easily people can get, you know, suckered <laughs> in to yeah. doing that kind of thing. They take it out of context. They take context. it out of context. Context and context. And, and that is not right. That's not what God has called us to. But you're right. It's amazing what people can be easily led astray with these days. And they can, see, the thing is, though, that they have scriptures that they will use out of context, but they use it to try to justify what they're doing. Like the snake well, handlers. It's the second thing about second baptism. Mm -hmm. Right? You right. Know, like churches are there. There's a second baptism. That's, that's what they call it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't so, Frank Sinatra sing about it? <laughs> did he call? Did he sing about a sink of baptism? I did it my way. Oh, there you go. That's that's fundamentally what it is. Exactly. They they develop their own religion mm -hmm. their way. Use, but see, see that's where they lead people astray today. Because remember, I've always said when we come into these classes, we need to know our Bibles. Because people love to grab our word, the word of God, and make it fit a way of belief for them. And if you don't know your Bible, they can lead you astray because they can say, yeah, let me show you. Here, look, see what it says here? But by showing you a verse or two, that's not showing you context. and It's not giving you insight. But if you don't know your Bible and you think, oh, well, he's showing me the Bible, so it must be right and you don't go research it for yourself to see and pray about it, you you go right down that path with them. And that's not where God wants you to be. But, but what is so sad is that a new Christian comes to, to a church like that. He doesn't know anything. So of course he's gonna be misled because he's, he becomes a Christian, he wants to know about God, know more about God. He's being taught, this is what the Bible said, and that's exactly what he's gonna believe. And that's Martin, Martin, but that Christian can pray for fellowship and brotherhood and sisterhood to be uplifted in the united uh, body. That church, that's the fellowship he's going to have from the member from that particular church. So they all believe the same thing. Because I believe me, I talk from experience. <laughs> oh yeah, I've been there too. I know. No, but I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if they pray, you know, for that fellowship, it's those prayers may be answered in God's time to lead them to a good body. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I can speak for experience. Look, I started listening to all the teacher, different point of view, and you say, okay, well, I see, I see it different now. Well, let, well, let me tell you something. You know what Jesus said about people that lead those little ones astray? Yep. Millstone. Exactly. I'll tell you, that's what a lot of these denominations are doing. They're leading people astray and keeping them from actually coming to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying, I know God can, you know, draw the person, even though they get in, kind of like what Jim's saying, you know, they may get into a body, but man, Jesus says, this is not where you need to be. And the Father can draw them and get them out of there. But I'm telling you what, I know that a lot of these denominations do a lot of damage to the body of Christ. Like you said, Martin, you've experienced it. I've experienced it because they lie to people and that's how they keep them in. But, but also, Ted, again, yeah. I, 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 I mean, some of those churches are not, I want to say, 
<laughs> Gotta be careful, but not yeah, anybody's yeah. doing it intentionally. I think it's more for ignorance. This is why they have yeah. learned, and it, it goes on from generation. Just like you, you were born to a Catholic church. Well, this is what you know. That's right. until you until you're being taught, you know, different different way. Right. I think the, the point there is a Bible based church because you have a lot of doctrines that are a little off or even a non denominational. And I think a Bible based church, word centered, is you know where you'll find that source. Exactly. But again, I don't think a person, you know, is going to be lost because that because he believes in a different way. Okay, he, maybe he not believe exactly what the Bible said, but that, that's not a point that you cannot, you cannot say, well, uh, these people are not Christian because let's say they speak in tongues. You know, because they basically, they, they, are, they are Christian. Yes, unfortunately, they, they're not. Going down the wrong track. But no, I agree with you. I mean, I, 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 I'm not, I need to be careful how I say that because Yes, uh, they can lead people astray, but that doesn't mean that Christ still can't do His work in that body if they have the if they've got Christ's word there, because people can still mm -hmm. see it and they can be convicted through it, through even though they may be getting some wrong gouge on a way to do certain things. Because I guarantee you, people in the Catholic Church, we're going to see many of them in heaven that have got, are going to have come to salvation through Jesus Christ. We'll see it yes, in a four-square yes. gospel. We'll see it in a first assembly of God. We'll see it in Baptist. We'll see it in Nazarene. Because God will do his work. He's already chosen who he's chosen. And it's going to work. His word is going to play out. You know, whether we want it to or not, hopefully we want it to. But I'm saying we as humanity want it to or not. God's word will work out because he's already written the book, period. The pastor in our first church that we went to, yeah, he uh, he had, uh, he had a saying. He said, "When you get to heaven, he goes, you're going to be surprised by some of the people that you see there." <laughs> yeah, he said, "But you're even going to be more surprised by some of the people you don't see there." I think that's the big issue. Yeah, yeah. because I mean, you makes a I, lot of sense. Because we have our own ideas, right? But God already knows. He's already got the picture painted. And, and again, uh, we, we judge for what we see. Yeah, right? Exactly. We see the Bible says we do. Yep. We behave certain way. Well, for us, we are Christian, but we will know their heart. We don't know what they that's do right. behind the scenes. That's right. Only God knows the heart. And that's what he watches in all of us every day. He knows our heart. So, amen. Amen. Any other final questions, comments, additions, subtraction, disagreements? Uh, well, I think it's cool that Paul has a sense of humor and it comes out. <laughs> a bit of sarcasm, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this was from about three weeks ago when we were studying the, the Last Supper. All my life I've heard about the Last Supper, but it didn't hit me until we studied that, that it's called the Last Supper because it was Jesus' Last Supper. And yep. the Lord's, the Lord, it's Lord's Supper, right? All of a sudden it's not sounding right. The Lord's yep. Supper, right. the reason he did it at the Last Supper was because it was his Last Supper. So he yep. was giving them something to remember him by. So and that, just, that was the key, Lord, right? In yes. remembrance of me, First Corinthians 11, right? Yeah. Yeah, but why he did it, when he did it, yeah. it hit me. It's just amazing how I hear something my whole life and then it hits me. Oh, good point. Yeah, exactly. That's a whole. That's a Holy Spirit. Amen. Reveals Amen. it to you, and that's who we rely on to give us that insight, right? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it is. It's beautiful. You're right. You're right. Amen. Okay, I've got some prayer items here already. Let's see here. I'm praying for Christine, uh, who picked up the COVID. Um, yeah. what's that that that's victor's uh a, one of her in his one of his prayer table friends uh and jimmy Knott's life group and uh and christina morgan lander christina morgan life lander leader. yeah so and now she's in the hospital i guess de getting that taken care of right well she she's uh uh she and her husband are the group leader of that table Oh, okay. And every Monday night, we have a meeting with Pastor Jimmy on, you know, Zoom meeting. Right, right. And uh, Monday night, she said that she was had chills uh, 
she had uh, had lost her sense of smell and taste. Mm -hmm. uh, was running a, a fever and coughing, and just felt like she couldn't breathe, and uh, uh, and was just totally out of energy. Oh, and those are uh, the signs. Yep. And so what the hot what the hospitals tell you is, if you have the symptoms, or if you think you got COVID nineteen or the symptoms, quarantine yourself. But if you start having real problems breathing, go to the hospital, like call the hospital and see what they want you to do. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't mess with it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Don't, don't wait. Yeah. Right. Because it moves pretty quickly. Yeah. Michael just texted me and said that she's uh, doing great. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. all right. Fantastic. But she is in the hospital still, right? Oh, no, she never went. Oh, she never went. She just. No isolated herself did they give her any medication no i don't know what they did no. okay. he, he just said that she's doing great well then we'll keep praying though we'll keep praying yeah definitely the, the other one was um uh lynn asked me to pray for cheryl for those who know cheryl we've been praying for the last few weeks and uh she's been having trouble breathing and she's been under care you know for this and obviously she wants to get back together like everybody else so but yeah, we want to keep her in prayer. I mean, she's had problems, other physical issues and ailment. I've known her back for a while back, and uh, and and Lynn would always sit at her table, like on Wednesdays when we go in and eat, have the meal downstairs. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's Cheryl. I remember when she fell and broke her leg or, or broke her arm was when she was in the choir kind of thing and fell. Um, we're praying also, uh, Lynn talked to Richard, um, and Richard, you know, poor guy. I mean, he's so isolated over there and I mean, he's, he's alone. If anybody gets an opportunity, give him a shout. I mean, he doesn't talk long, but he'd love just to hear somebody say, Hey, Richard, we're missing you. And, uh, you know, uh, we look forward to when we can get back together. And I guarantee you, he's not going to talk long. He's not going to talk more than a few minutes with you. Right. So he's not going to keep you on the phone for long, but I'm sure he'd love to hear from a diverse group of you. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, if, if you want, if you feel like you want to call him, let me give you a phone number. Uh, let's see here. I know I've got it. Oh, here it is. Uh, the Westminster Towers, I think you can get to him direct at 407 992 4740. 407 992 4740. Um, do you have his do you have his room number? Yeah, because sometimes um, sometimes it goes to the um, yeah. switchboard. If it goes to the switchboard. Say that you uh, to patch you to assisted living room 206. Assisted right. living room 206. So whether he picks up at that number or if you get if the switchboard decides they're going to pick up, then assisted living room 206 will get you to Richard Harrop. His last they name Harrop. H A R R U P. Yeah. What's that? Because they have uh, they have the area for where people with dementia. Right. And then assisted living. Yeah, well, and they keep, they're keeping them isolated big time, okay, because they want to try to keep everybody as, as right. safe as possible. And also, uh, Lynn says she talked to David. David's doing better, but David, yeah, and she saw him at church on Sunday, was right. able to give him a hug, and I know David wants to get back with us too, you know, that kind of thing. David Hughes? No, David uh, Washburn in our oh. class. Yeah, he, he called me Sunday. Wanted to know where I was. Oh, there you go. <laughs> where are you, Victor? <laughs> I decided not to go. Yeah, yeah. So okay, we'll be praying for them. And let me see. I think there was one other thing. Ted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't forget my daughter and the grandkids still. Yeah. You got it. I, I gotta get going. Okay. You got it, my brother. Hey, we'll be. We'll, I'll put her in the prayer. Thank you. Uh, good night, Doug. Bye. I got to go, Ted, also. So okay, brother. Take care, Take brother Martin. Martin. God bless you. Good night, Martin. Okay. Yeah. Daughter and grandchildren. And uh, okay. Anybody else? Prayer requirement, prayer request. 
Okay. It's well, then let's pray. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together to study your word. And man, you know, your word is powerful, Lord, and we thank you that you've given it to us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to study it. But more importantly, Lord, help us to live it out. May you, Holy Spirit, bring us together in unity in such a way to where we are so tightly bound that we can sense each other's needs and be there for each other, whether in mourning or in, you know, just rejoicing together or whatever the situation. But that we would also be sensitized to the gifting you've given us to be able to help each other out in the body of Christ, to elevate them and to meet their needs. And Lord, help us to walk not after the flesh, but that we would walk in the spirit so that we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. Also, Lord, I pray for your strength in and through it all, that we may be your children and reflect you. Next week, we're going to be reading the chapter on love. And I'll tell you what, if that doesn't convict us, I don't know what will. Because I know we fall so short in reflecting your love, not just in the body of Christ, but to anybody we meet, Lord, we need your strength to be able to overcome our own prejudices and our own weaknesses, that we may be surrendered into the point where we consider others better than ourselves and show that love. I believe Philippians 2 is where you, where you talk about that. So, Lord, help us to walk in your way, to bring you honor and glory in all that we do, and help us to become more united together not just in this group, because I know we are tight together here, Lord, but I'm talking about in our church bodies. Lord, we need to be more effective for you. We need to lose our individuality and become collectivistic and loving and tied to each other in our bodies of Christ. Help us to do that, Lord, to reflect you so that others will see that love in us as the body of Christ and say, I want some of that too. Because that's the best way. I think that's the best way to reach people today. Not through big concerts or through gimmicks to try to get people in. But that they may see your love in us and say, that's what they want. They want to become part of the family of God. So Lord, I pray also now for Christina. You know, thank you, Lord, that we just got an update that she's doing better, Lord, and mm -hmm. that she may potentially have that coronavirus. You know what her condition is, Lord. I pray for your healing hand on her and her total recovery and quick recovery, Lord. And I know that you are Jehovah Rapha, God, our healer. So mm -hmm. we look to you in this matter, Lord, and we trust that you will do what you say you will do. We also want to thank you for David, Lord, that he was able to get David Washburn get over and get to the service on Sunday, and that Lynn was able to see him, give him a hug. Lord, thank you that he's out and about, because that tells me that his, his stomach's doing better and he's feeling better. So, Lord, give him peace, and it'll be great to when we are all united together and we don't have to necessarily be doing it through a video. But that way we can all spend time with each other and be able to hug and give each other that holy kiss, as it were, Lord, I pray. Also pray for Cheryl, Lord, who's still going through some difficult times with her breathing. Lord, you know what she's going through. And, man, you know, just like David Wash, she wants to get together. Just like Richard, she wants to get together and with us all together as the body of Christ. Because, you know, I mean, that's where unity displays itself is when we are getting together and we're able to spend time together in person more so. But thank you that you've given us this vehicle of Zoom. At least we can still get together virtually and be able to study your word and to get to know you better, Lord. I also pray for Richard as, as he's, you know, isolated in that, you know, assisted living area and with all of those people. Lord, that you would keep him safe. But more than anything, give him peace, Lord, your peace that surpasses understanding. And let us show you his, let us show him your love as we reach out to him too, Lord, I pray. I also pray for dogs, Doug and Gail's daughter and their grandchildren. Thank you, Lord, that you've continued to give her hours and her work to be able to meet her needs. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we also pray for their safety 
as they are in a higher risk area for contracting the virus. Continue to keep them safe. You've shown yourself so wonderful in keeping them safe today. We ask you to continue that, Lord, and be with their family. I want to thank you for all the rain we've gotten, Lord, this boy. We sure needed it, Lord, and I thank you for the rain. I pray for our leaders in our country that you would continue to give them wisdom. And mm -hmm. Lord, man, I don't know how to pray for this, but Holy Spirit, I pray that you address it to the Father rightly because, man, is, if there's some way to get our press under control so that they're not just, you know, stirring up people, and I think... Mm -hmm. You know, just getting people all riled up in a mob mentality kind of thing, but that we would learn to reach out to each other and care for each other and love each other and respect each other and get rid of our prejudices. I think that's more important than stirring people's, uh, you know, sh uh, shortcomings in life. Um, because, I mean, people just get so polarized so quickly. Oh, Lord, I just pray for wisdom that you give our presses wisdom in their objectivism and not be so subjective in their reporting just so that they can get ratings, Lord, and, you know, causing discontent and disrupting, you know, good human life. So, Lord, we look to you in all of this. We pray for those who are caring for those that have the coronavirus and those that are seeking a solution to mitigate the the whole coronavirus issue, whether through some healing remedy and or through vaccination, we ask you to keep them safe and give them wisdom in what they're doing so that they can be able to overcome this issue. I pray for all of our families, Lord, that you would be there for each and every one of us and let us be a witness and a light and salt and, you know, light to them and that we would show them your love. And we'll talk about that more next week, that we would be you know, somebody that they can say, that's, that, I want, you know, what my uncle or my father or, you know, my grandfather has um, or my grandmother has. That, that kind of, you know, attitude, that kind of life, that kind of understanding. Uh, but it's something that would be attractive to them, Lord, because actually your love is attractive, Lord when we don't let our human factors get involved in the process and kind of twist it. But let us show love, even when it hurts. Because, I mean, your kind of love is a sacrificial love. And let us love each other that way too, I pray. But more than anything in the process of showing that love, bring us together in your unity in a way that brings you honor and glory. Mm -hmm. Now, love, be with us as we go, I pray. And show yourself to us in a mighty way. And let us surrender and be chosen vessels to you in a way that brings you the most honor and glory, I pray. We love you and we praise you. We give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious, wonderful name, amen. 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 Thank you, Ted. Hey, my Thank pleasure, you, everybody. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Ted. Ted. Good night, everybody. All glory good to the night. Lord. Yeah. Good night, Sally. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Hey, good night, Aaron. Good night. Good good night, love to Liz and the family. Will do. Thank you. You got yeah. it, brother. Stay healthy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Take care, Amen. Tina. I saw that wave. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Andy. God bless, brother. Thank you. Take Thanks. care, Marco. Appreciate it. You too, man. You got it. Take care, Marco and Lori. God bless you, my brother and sister. Yeah. You you, cake or not? Take it easy, Victor. What's that? Are you keep eating your cake? <laughs> I need more cake. <laughs> I want my cake and I want to eat it too. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, talk, you feel young. You, you sound younger. You don't yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I, and I need it too. Yeah. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, take care. Good yeah. night, Ted. Good night, yeah. Margaret. Thank you, my sister. You have a great evening. And I'll see you, what, Good Saturday? Day. Yeah, Saturday afternoon. You got it, my sister. Well, God bless you. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye.